Ready? Yeah. Okay. Welcome. Thank you. Yep. So, hi everyone. I'm Annalise Kays. I'm with Plant Village and their executive director. And so, a little bit about myself is I have a background in biological engineering. I specialize in food security and processes, and I'm equally passionate about it. Um, and so, today I'm going to go through a brief presentation about Plant Village and along with mainly focusing on our application, so that's Plant Village Nuru, and how it works with smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa to increase their farm productivity. And so the first thing that we'll address for today is the themes which of the presentation, which also coincide with our, the, um, why our group has to exist in this day and age. And so we believe that the knowledge to grow the food that feeds your family is everyone, every human's right, and that farmers are their own solutions as well, meaning that no one is going to come on a farm and know that field better than a farmer would. And so, this picture, this situation is a great depiction of why we are also here today. And so this was taken and posted on Twitter by former US to UN ambas ambassador, Kip Tom. And so I'll read briefly what the tweet was and then um, talk about it in a bit. So this is a depiction of a farmer in 800 BC in Zimbabwe. I saw farmers using almost the same hoe in the same position over 2,800 years later. Providing access to mechanization can increase food security and growth in rural economies, improving the quality of people's lives. And so this is why we are here today. And in this scale, in this situation, the needle is not moving on the scale of increasing farm productivity or access to new technologies. And in an increasingly situation, it's, it's moving backwards because of climate change and these different situations and the changing variables that farmers are experiencing now. And so I'd like everyone to, to think about while I'm talking for the next uh, eight minutes or so about why this situation hasn't changed since 800 BC. So that was why we exist, but who and, and how. Uh, so we are a research and development group out of Pennsylvania State University. And so we exist, we started as a knowledge platform and you can see a screenshot of the website in the middle here. And so on this knowledge platform, we curated one of the world's largest in crop and pest and disease information libraries that's publicly available to anyone um, who has access to the website. But of course that access to the website is a, is a challenge in and of itself. So then we made this more accessible in providing it all, all this information available in a smartphone and having it run locally and offline as well. So that pushed us into uh, the computer vision field and then more so into remote sensing. So now we have an AI assistant that works with the farmer in the phone um, and also pulls in different satellite values and measurements to then give the farmer more information on their field for in the moment and then predictions for the future. This wouldn't be possible, of course, without our collaborative partners and, and scientists. So we work a lot with CGIAR institutions and UNFAO. And then in order to make sure this information is readily available and access to hundreds of thousands of farmers across every country is we work with local organizations and companies to deliver this content, whether it's through TV, SMS, or radio. And so this is a brief uh, capture of what the application looks like. It's free to download um, on the Google Play Store. It's only available on Androids right now. And so we have the main menu on the left and it can take you through the different um, screens. So you can go from to diagnosing your field with the crop diagnos diagnostic tool, which is used in computer vision. Um, and then you can get advice once you go through the diagnostic process 
or and then also we have options in different languages as well, which is continuously growing and improving. And so um, it's important for us to stay aware of what the existing challenges are with the language barriers. And so for this, the rest of this talk, I'm going to briefly describe a situation that is very common across our farmers. Um, and so, and it's of a story of Josephine. And so on the left is a picture of a field that she had started planting and, and was in maintaining when we first met with her. So you can see that in some of these crops on the left, they're diseased based on how yellow they are. Uh, obviously some of the cuttings did not germinate. Um, so this is cassava, of course. And so, um, and then this picture on the right is a, is a great, and a great description of what can happen with access to technology. So we started on the left and we end up on the right. And this is how we did so. So this is a, a capture of what the disease diagnostic tool looks like. So this is a very diseased cassava leaf. It's um, a cassava mosaic disease. And so when you hold your phone over the leaf, there's a convolutional neural network running in the background that will um, provide these disease boxes. Let me play that again and pause it. So it's taking in the image and feeding it through the neural network in, that's running offline in the phone and then proposes these boxes as a confidence value of what, it, what the phone believes the disease to be. So in this case, it's cassava mosaic disease. The boxes cover not only the symptoms, but the entire leaf as well. And so that's not as important for um, cassava foliar diseases when they affect the entire leaf, but in other crops and diseases showing the distinct disease mark is a really beneficial education tool, which was um, something that this duels as. So it's not only telling you the health of your field, but also providing an education by learning now what a cassava leaf looks like and that particularly what a diseased cassava leaf looks like. And so this is um, a really important distinction in when we gave Josephine the phone, she so we gave it to her about October of 2018, and we can see there was minimal activity. This is um, the number of records per day in this chart. And so there's minimal activity in the beginning, and there was due to some of the issues we had worked out with like a challenges to access to data um, and some general issues with running on a low end smartphone. But eventually in December, then we got a notification that Josephine had used the phone a, a total of over 80 times in the like in a two day span. And that really struck us odd because uh, we hadn't seen this behavior from any other farmer before. And so late then we then we met up with Josephine and asked her um, what she was working on. And this was the fruits of her labor in a sense. And so she decided what, so when we initially worked and built the application, we had um, believed that the main use would be for diagnosing diseased fields and diseased plants. But what Josephine did was she took the phone and diagnosed healthy plants. So she went through her field at the end of the season and checked each plant individually, marked off the healthy ones, and then came back and propagated from the, only the healthy plants. And so the one other thing I wanted to highlight is in this period here where there's no activity, that's when she was planting, preparing. And then in the beginning, this start of activity in March as well was another really excellent habit that was started was checking your field at the one to two month mark and then three month mark. And so by doing so, she was able to catch any disease that could have came, come in from another um, way. So through a, an insect vector, which she learned about through the app as well. And so this was a way for her to propagate an entirely clean seed field and also maintain that clean seed. And so this is why we believe farmers are their own solutions. And now Josephine has been able to gain enough income and produce enough a larger harvest that she's diversified her crops into soybeans as well. And so this past growing season, she was able to fill this entire 
uh, truck up with, with soybean harvest, which is really excellent. And so in this situation, the needle makes a leap in that we're going from this previously used technology for the past 2,800 years to a smartphone in a farmer's hand that can increase their productivity, increase the productivity of their community and diversify um, their income. And so I wanted to save these for the end because I'm sure I've run over time, but the last few things about the application is this is the form that the um, satellite data comes into. So it can, we provide this graph, although after being told by farmers that it wasn't very useful for them, we transitioned into this smiley face um, and colored green, yellow, and red um, scenario so that you can easily check to see the status of your field based on what the current situation is and then what the predicted situation is. And then, and then we also recognize that one of the challenges is one smartphone to one person, not very scalable or sustainable. We can't give smartphones to every farmer. And so, um, through working with a community network style where we have lead farmers and then following farmers, our AI system is able to teach and reach more farmers and promotes community-led solutions. And so this is a situation of where well, this is Madame Berta. This is in this white box here is her house. Um, these are all of her farmers that she travels to, which is blown out here. And then these two boxes in the top right corner are actually her field. So she travels more frequently and often to her neighbors and family members fields um, than her own, which is an extremely exciting solution in and of itself. And then the last thing is um, in Kenya, we have our dream team, which are local agricultural graduate students who work in the communities with the farmers to help diversify and um, share this information that the farmers are learning and also provide technological support because in a lot of these um, situations, the farmers are first, uh, first time smartphone users. And so it takes a little bit of training to go through and, and learn, but we do it together. We often say it takes a village in plant village. So, and so I just wanted to leave everyone off with, um, our conclusion was that smallholder farmers in Sub-Saharan Africa need a radical change, a technological leap, and we believe it's through a land-grant university in a phone. And because it's so farmers also need increased access to knowledge to drive farmer-made solutions. Thank you everyone for listening, and I'll stop sharing my screen now. Thank you so much, uh, Annalise, that's fantastic. Um, so I'd like to invite people to um, introduce themselves and uh, um, ask any questions in the chat. Um, but while we're doing that, um, Harry um, is working um, with, in a similar way to your, um, to your agents in um, Kenya with the digital champions in Magumu. So um, he's been training them on Plant um, Village. So Harry, would you like to just share um, uh, some observations um, about how it's going there. Uh, sure. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, the moment uh, Plan Nora introduced to me and me introduced to Digital Champion, uh, we had some a little bit of challenge with the issue of language, as you know, in uh, Tanzania, our first language is Kiswahili. So some of the Kiswahili it has some. Um, a problem, but we've worked on that with a uh, uh, plant neuro team and we fixed it. Uh, so uh, I took an, uh, an initiation or to start um, uh, to start trying it on the farmer we have in uh, Serengeti Safe House uh, to see if how, how it's work and how it can help to uh, for our crops that we have in our garden in our farms. And uh, we have passed over it. I've tried to record to see if there is uh, some pest and disease in the farm. And it's really a good tool that's really helped to keep recording the tracking of your farm and how your farm is grown and your crop. So uh, after trying it on my farm, I've visited some, uh, some of the digital champion in the village. We have like um, 84 digital champion in Serengeti. So I've reached a couple of them, like uh, five of them. 
to try to teach them on how to use it in the farm, in their farms, and how productive can it be. So uh, the feedback from the digital champion it was quite um, good, and they really uh, they were emphasizing on trying to uh, keep on educating them about the tools because they find it very good and quite useful for them. Is uh, helping them a lot on tracking their crops and. Uh, Yesterday I was in the village also trying to, uh, to train the digital champion and using it with some uh, villagers in one of the village called Nyambori. And we found out their farms, uh, in the uh, maize farm, they've got some diseases, like uh, I think it's, it was almond disease in their, uh, in their farm. So uh, we use Pratnol to detect the diseases and it's also give us the suggestion of what kind of, um, what kind of measure we can take. And also they, uh, so I, I was like with, uh, I was with the farm and I was with the villagers and digital champion discussing about how they can solve the problem and where they can find the medicine to cure their farms. So uh, those are the signs that the, uh, the primary is really working very quite good in the farm uh, and the villagers. So uh, the most only the challenge that they are facing in the villages are, there are very few people with a smartphone in the village, so uh, we have to use sometimes our own phone and digital champion phones so to get, to correct the information of the farm. Uh, so far, the primary is quite a good tool for collecting and uh, detecting the pests in the farms. So I, I, I do believe if we could uh, provide the knowledge to uh, a wide group of people and the farmers, I think it will be very benefit for in the sector of agriculture and the, uh, and the people depending on agriculture. Thank you, Harry. Um, so maybe we can go on to Revi now talking about um, digital tools more generally, and then we can have some, quest some questions after that. And please do introduce yourself in the chat, everyone, if you'd like to. Great. Well, hi, everybody. Um, my name is Revy Sterling, and I've got the pleasure and honor of working with Janet over the last few years on a USAID funded project called the Women Connect Challenge, which is now in its fourth round. Um, and uh, the Magumu community was part of the first round of funding, um, of course, working with alleviating and um, yeah, the, the, the alleviating FGM, et cetera, um, in Magumu. And I'm so happy to meet Harry and understand that there's even more digital activities going on because once you have something happening in a community, once you have that network and that connectivity and that equipment, um, obviously there are more things you can do in the development sectors writ large. So my background is, um, is, is technology. I was a software engineer for a long time. And then I got very involved with how technology was being was excluding, you know, so many marginalized peoples around the world, especially my focus has always been on gender and uh, especially since there's so much feminization of the agriculture industry and so many things are changing. I'm super excited to meet Annalise because it's always neat to meet and Janet says, yes, I need to get out more often and stop being so excited about digital apps. But um, at the same time, it's wonderful to see something like this that's so useful um, and comes from a university. My, yeah, I'm a former, I'm a recovered professor and I'm trying to get back into the university setting. I've been away from it for five years now and I really miss um, just the energy and uh, the creativity and the research that can come out of universities, especially when those universities collaborate with universities and people around the world. Um, and I was excited to see Annalise, uh, your slide on partnerships at the end, um, because so much digital development, as everybody knows, has been, you know, cursed by the number of pilots that we have with people not working together. So to see that you're working with organizations like Media and others is just really, really exciting. And um, I'm going to get into my slides. There's only there's so few of us that I don't want to overwhelm you with this huge lecture on how technology is failing women, which is really kind of all I do um, is lecture about these things. But I'm going to try to take a little bit of, uh, you know, maybe we can be a little more interactive with it, um, et cetera. And, and if you see other things that aren't specifically um, germane to the communities you work in, I'd love to hear about it, et cetera. So let me share my screen. Let's start over here. 
Okay. Well, so, uh, Annalise, since I see your camera, will you give me a thumbs up if you can see the slide? Yay. Okay. So anyhow, I will just jump into it. Come on, little slide. Okay, so, you know, we have known for, you know, a long time, ever since technology started coming, you know, to communities, um, back in, let's say, the, the the turn of this millennium around 2000, you know, when we started with ICT for development and other programs around the world, um, that, you know, women just simply didn't have access to this digital tool set the way men did. And it seems so funny to me that technologists and development professionals were surprised by this because they, of course, thought, well, everyone's going to have a phone, everyone's got a laptop, everyone has connectivity. And it's just that it, it, I mean, I, I can't think of a worse fallacy to perpetuate out there. And yet that is the kind of thing we are up against all of the time. And we know what the barriers are to women's use of technology and access to technology. And I focus mostly on the last bullet, which is really the social norms and the cultural barriers um, and the fact that so many communities simply don't want women online. Um, it, it challenges the status quo. Um, and we all know that empowered women are terrifying um, because there's all sorts of things. You know, they might talk back to their husbands. They might be on their mobile phones instead of taking care of kids. All the things I hear from community members all the time, how mobiles plus women is bad. Um, and then mobile internet on top of that. Oh my gosh, you know, women are going to learn bad habits, they're going to be bad wives. And it's just, for me, this is so anathema of what I do see in communities, which is that we have technology on one hand, able to scale and sustain uh, projects and get and move the needle like Annalise was talking about from, you know, a very manual tool to a much more digitized solution. And we have women that we know are the the key to sustainable community development in, in, in globally. Um, and this is where I always talk about how this is sort of this unbalanced equation where women plus tech should be this amazing combination, this force multiplier in communities, and yet women continue to be excluded for social and cultural reasons. And of course, they don't have the purchasing power or the literacy or the confidence in a lot of cases to use digital tools, even if they are available. And I think this is very important in the agriculture space, given the high percentage of women that are uh, sustenance farmers and our smallholder farmers. Um, and what I'm worried about when I see a lot of agricultural digital tools come out is that at least in the past, women would be allowed to talk to a human face in terms of a agricultural extension officer, things like that. Uh, whereas now, if everything moves to a smartphone and there is no connectivity, or it's a very restrictive culture that has even perhaps banned women's cell phone use as uh, some of the communities I've, I've worked in around the world, especially Northern India, then you can't, then they don't even get to, then there's no opportunity for information exchange. Um, and then I hear, you know, I, I, and there are so many digital apps out there, and this is not, um, I'm really, I, I'm not trying to criticize Nuru at all because Nuru sounds very, very thoughtful. But here's what I hear when I see women with phones that look like this. You know, they don't have a phone that's good enough, or they have spent all of their money on a very poor, low feature, broken smartphone that barely can even connect to anything, um, that applications are confusing. And the really sad thing where, where I always see is women saying they're too dumb to use the phone or the phone is in a different language. My phone is French and I don't speak French because maybe somebody brought it back from um, I often see this in Western Africa where people are bringing back uh, phones and technology from where they've done agricultural work in Europe and then are bringing back phones. Um, and then it's just expensive, of course, with charging, uh, with airtime, with data. Uh, we keep creating these things in vacuums and then wondering why they fail out in the field. Um, I won't go into this too much because there is a lot of literature on this, but um, I mean, I would say what generally doesn't work is that um, most of the people designing uh, for agriculture aren't even considering gender in the equation. Um, and they're not really considering the fact that perhaps women can't come to a training because they can't leave their shamba or um, because there's no in real life gender equity. So why would that, why would all of a sudden that they have empowerment online? And so there's really that need for that deep cultural understanding. Now, in some communities, women, you know, agriculturalists have a lot of power and say, um, this is for the, you know, the, the several million who, who don't. Um, 
I'll say some of the things that I've seen really work well in agricultural applications uh, are things that are voice and, and uh, voice based and pictorial based. Uh, I was happy to see uh, the really lovely uh, resolution in the pictures that Annalise was showing um, because why bother with text? Uh, you know, first of all, I can't even get my, my, my own graduate students to read, let alone anybody else, this large you know, chunks of text on what you should do, especially if you have uh, low, low data transfer, especially if you're a low literate or illiterate woman, which we know that most of the world's illiterate population is female. And so why wouldn't we do it voice and video based? Why wouldn't we do it with alternative inputs? Um, also, I really think that there's a lot to be said for building up women's confidence to use technology in the first place. So um, I'd be curious if anybody you know, from Tanzania knows that one of our other Women Connect projects with Viamo was putting a um, an IVR channel in just to build women's confidence with technology so they could dial into the 321 service and actually hear things like, what is the internet? What kind of phone do I have to have? What is the safety issue? What is spam? What is fraud? Um, how do I know if I have battery life? Just all of these questions. What is email versus internet? What is a social network? Just to have them understand so they weren't so overwhelmed by this prospect of this is an expensive thing. I'm going to break it. I you know, I have to do this right um, and kind of demystifying technology. And then, of course, with the emerging technologies, uh, artificial intelligence, et cetera, where does it make sense to actually bring these pieces in and make people's lives easier with technology? So this is sort of my little list of eight things that I think really work, especially in ag tech. Um, which is you know, really uncovering under what conditions can women use technology, how to meet them where they're at. And then of course, what Magumu does well is you know, addressing the on online, uh, you, they're, they're addressing real life GBV, but how do we address online GBV? I see a lot of communities say, I would like to be able to let my wives and daughters, you know, use technology, but I'm worried they're going to be harassed. I'm worried this is going to reflect poorly on the community. Um, and then building those confidence with ag tech. If a woman already is excelling in a certain area like cassava growth, what else can she do with this? I've heard a lot of things with like, I don't think I have the right word for it. I'm not an agriculturalist, but uh, vitic no, viticulture is wine. There's something with worms, vermiculture. People are doing a lot, you know, with more like, oh, I can build my own fertilizer. Oh, I can do this. Oh, I can do that. I can add eggshells. They can exchange things in a way that uh, we normally didn't. And I think the biggest issue, especially in communities where technology is just being introduced and is a bit of a challenge to swallow from a cultural barrier perspective is really highlighting the men and the family members and the community leads that are excited about women's technology use and really holding them up as an example of, you know, promoting good development and, and, and good agricultural practices. I wrote a blog um, that I'm putting here on a little bitly that goes um, into, oh, I like that I messed up and have a graphic covering the woman's face. That's 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 charming. Um, but I wrote this blog because it really tries to get into more issues and things like, why are we spending so much money on ag tech when at the end of the day, women would rather use WhatsApp in certain situations? And how do we meet them where they're at? And if you have no connectivity, are there good offline capabilities uh, to bring to communities that remain offline? I mean, I, I am I'm thrilled by all the connectivity advancements in East East Africa um, and you know, Nigeria and other places where we have representation from the phone uh, in this call. But when I'm in Niger or Chad, it's I, there is no internet to speak of. So these are really the women that I'm trying to reach with a lot of more offline online scenarios. And let's see, I will close. Um, all of these pictures are taken from the Women Connect Challenge and now we're in the fourth round of it. And I'm super excited because maybe that means I can uh, work with Nuru and Plant Village more and continue to work more in Tanzania. Um, uh, first of all, let me also for the Tanzanians on the phone, my condolences for the loss of your president, but very excited about seeing a woman now in charge. And uh, I look forward to getting back on the ground and being back in Tanzania. Yeah. So thank you for your time. Thank, thank you so much, Revi. That was uh, fantastic. And I would very much recommend um, reading your blog if people haven't done. Maybe you can put it in the chat and then sure, I'll sure. send it to um, people um, 
who registered. So if, if anybody has any questions, please either put them in the chat or um, feel free to unmute yourself and talk them, since there's so few of us. Um, otherwise, I, I I'd like to say that, um, much of what you... Can I just chip in with a... Go on, Simon. Observation. Yeah, go on. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Uh, hi, hi, sorry, yes. This, um, this gives me echoes of um, the uh, Farm Radio Africa thing that was happening here, which we, we, we learned about in our organization through a, a talk at uh, the ECHO conference in Arusha a few years ago, where they're doing something, it sounds very similar, but it's through radio. And I was just, what, um, what was just being said then about, you know, kind of, women being scared about using technology because it might mean that the men think they're up to no good. Like everybody's got access to the radio. So I don't know whether there's any um, any scope in linking the two together. Like the, the, the findings that are coming out of the apps somehow get communicated to radio stations to broadcast the, the general findings in that region or that that area. Um, just, uh, just a thought coming from, you know, what I've seen in other places doing. Thank you, Simon. I love community radio. That's where I started off. That's what my dissertation work was in, was in adding interactivity to community radio and trying to connect IVR and community radio. Community radio to me is the answer to almost everything um, because you know women, it, it's not seen as a disruptive technology, even though it really can be. Men don't take the radio out of the home when they leave. They leave it there. I mean, women can listen, they can take it. I mean, I love community radio. My problem with community radio is getting it funded because when I go to USAID, when I go to World Bank, even when I go to Gates Foundation, who has been generous, especially with um, farm radio, um, it's always been interesting because people go, oh, radio's old. We want to, we want to, smartphones, smartphones, smartphones. And there's such this need to have a sexy and emerging technology. And it's just, it's the bane of my existence that I have a very hard time getting funders excited about community radio when that's where the reach and the trust often is. Um, and we just have to keep Keep always uh, pushing for community radio integration with solutions because um, I can't tell you. I mean, for it, it, how many years I've gone, I've tried to get funding for community radio, and unless it's bundled with something that has the word smartphone or AI or blockchain or all of these whizzy wig, you know, these these crazy whizzy terms, um, uh, it's it's just hard to fund. But I'm with you 100. percent Yes, totally. Uh, we, we, we're very interested in doing some um, work with community radios, particularly around adult literacy. Um, but linking it together with the, with the smartphone app, I think, could be potentially really valuable. Um, so, An Annalise, I don't know if you considered this or if you think it would work. Yeah, absolutely. This is something that Plant Village actively works on. So in my last slide, we had the partners and we work with the media company. And so with them, we target, um, we work with iShamba and then Shamba Shape Up. So that's TV and SMS, not radio. Um, however, we did work with um, IVR systems in Ethiopia and through ATA when we are pretty forefront in the desert locust crisis. And so in that particular situation, which is what we would like to transfer into Plant Village Nuru as well, is we had a separate application, eLocus 3M, where it was a surveillance, a monitoring and surveillance tool where anyone could go around and scout and submit a survey of whether there was desert locust present or not. That survey and smartphone application information was then used and transferred into um, information that could be either uh, sent out through the TV or through radio and just giving people advice on this is where we've spotted locusts before. We're expecting them to move in this direction. Here's how to prepare. And so that's a very uh, unique case study, but can be easily um, transferred to crop diagnostics. And so in the situation where we have farmers, even if it's one smartphone in a community, that smartphone travels around to so many farms, we get a good enough sample of what's happening on the ground. So whether it's, if there's, well, there's two things. We get a good idea of what's planted. Usually it's a lot of maize. Um, and then by knowing that we can also determine, uh, we get information on what's affecting the maize because we get pictures along with the surveys. And so we're able to see from one picture 
information that can give you, that can tell you what the soil quality is, what diseases are affecting it, if there's any conservation agriculture applied or irrigation. And so from that one picture, we can then say, well, this looks like an area that could be really, uh, that has low resilience to climate shock if it's um, in terms of if there's going to be a flood or a drought. And so we can send specific SMS or radio messaging to that area or to the nearby areas and um, say, this is what we've gathered from the information from Nuru. And this is what we would, um, this is what we expect to happen. Here are some potential solutions. And then here's people you can reach out to as well um, that are in your area. So Annalise, it sounds like you have a lot of women that are using Nuru. I mean, your examples were mostly female, et cetera. Are you, um, are you just work, are you lucky to be working in places where there's not a huge gender digital divide or have you been doing something very specific to on-ramp women? I'm just, um, I mean, I mean, no Tanzania doesn't have, I've run into some very interesting, you know, a, a mix of ranges in Tanzania where I've worked with women's, you know, groups that seem very empowered with technology. And then I've worked in communities where um, it's very restrictive. So what has been the key for you working with women? We, um, so when we disseminate and go through and share our application and, and give out smartphones, we target a group of 80% women or more. We recognize that, um, that women are, the, we believe the most important part of the agriculture and um, increasing their farm productivity. And so by specifically reaching out to, so we, we have the community network, we have the lead farmers and following farmers. And so the lead farmers are those who are volunteers within their community, typically well recognized and respected. Um, some of them even work for other organizations or lead women table banking groups. And so someone who's really understood and able to reach many people within their community. They then receive the training and the smartphone. And um, the only expectation is that we, is that they um, return a social interest in that they travel to their neighboring fields and conduct surveys and help disseminate the information. So then we'll continue to provide and interact with trainings with the lead farmers and their falling farmers. And then the lead farmer takes that those trainings to their farmers as well. So in that situation where Madame Berta had traveled to 23 farms, those are her core following farmers in which she's reaching all of them. And then with, in addition to the smartphone, we have a feature phone friendly service, which is free for farmers to join. It's SMS um, and they're able to message and ask questions. So sometimes they'll message and say, can someone bring the new roof phone by? And then that will get in touch with our nearest um, dream team member and then connect them through that way. Can I ask about the lead farmers? Are you supporting them with data or, at all or, or not? Yep, yep. So we recognize that um, access to data and mobile network is a big challenge at this point. And so something that we, we do provide data bundles for them. It, we provide, I believe it's two GBs for one month. So I would say 98% of the application runs offline. So they don't need a lot of data. The only portion of data that they need is to actually upload the surveys, which is not critical for the farmer. It's only for us to then make those um, decisions to, to reach more people with that with their specific farm information. And so, um, so we do provide data on a monthly basis, but are actively working with other organizations and, and particularly governments in free ratings, plant village data. Um, because if you treat it similar to um, like a fire brigade or something, when you call it, if your house is on fire, you have to call the fire, fire police and then um, you don't get charged for that. That would, because it's a public good. And so working to make plant village a public good in that understanding and accessing your not your uh, agricultural information is your human right, then um, we believe that would be a sustainable way to uh, having more data for people to use Plant Village. Thank you. Is, do you think that's likely to happen in Tanzania anytime soon? I think that's a, a great question. Um, I would be hopeful to say yes. Um, we've had talks with um, governments and Safaricom in the past and it, it wasn't positive, but we believe with the 
case study of the eLocus 3M application where we had over 26,000 records completed within six months time compared to from 1840, from 1945, or sorry, I'm mixing up the dates. Um, from 1984 to 2018, there was only, I believe 18,000 surveys collected that that's a very strong case for free rating the plant village data just because it provides so much more access to information and, and on ground situations. And it means less time figuring out what the situation is and more time taking action. So, so you've done a lot of training in Kenya. Um, I think you have some plans to do training in Tanzania. Um, do you have a schedule for that? We do not have a schedule for that at the moment. I know we had talked previously about it and we were working with um, Shamba Box to get those training set up. And it's just, um, I believe they've been halted for COVID reasons would be my guess. Um, so, but we are available to, to travel and come down as long as we're um, taking every, all precautions necessary. Fantastic. Well, I, we're very keen to do more in Magumu um, so, and, and other areas of Mara. Great. Any other comments or questions from other people here? I was really interested in um, what you were saying about the, the sorts of analysis that you can do based on um, and how that could then f feed into government information or radio information and so on. I mean, how much, how many people um, would you need to have involved in a specific area um, to be able to do that? Um, and where does that information go um, if people are interested and I, I'm also wondering how that can be potentially linked with what crowd to map are, are doing in terms of mapping but also in terms of remote sensing and so on. Yeah so we're, I don't have an exact answer for you yet we're actually in the middle of a project that was funded by the Gates Foundation in which we're testing a hypothesis that we need we only need less than 10% of um, on ground surveys to then make a, to make or to provide advice and make an actual simulation of the situation that's on the ground um, for the neighboring area. So it, it's based on a, a region basis. Uh, so we're in the middle of that right now. And we're within that uh, project as well, we're testing what the difference between uh, SMS data compared to a lead farmer with a smartphone's data looks like compared to um, just anyone traveling along the road and happens to take a picture. So if it's uploaded to like a Facebook or Twitter social media page, what can, what does each information channel provide and how what's the quality relative to the other channels? So how does that affect the advice that's given out then? Um, but in to answer your other question then as well as what information can we get from these um, surveys? So when the, when the farmer does a survey and checks the health of their field, it is stored locally on the phone and then is submitted to us when they have um, enough network to submit it. And along with that, just comes the information of um, your location. So then we can put it into some different code and then it pulls down satellite imagery information on the, um, like your net primary productivity or how well your crop is growing, the precipitation for the area, um, as well as evapotranspiration. So that was an important thing we uh, learned from when with our partner at FAO and the Whopper group, which is water uh, productivity through rem remote sensing. Um, and so from when we specifically on that page, the slide where I had those graphs, 
if your precipitation, so when we look at the graphs and we pull in this information, we can look at it from a 10 day period and then also a 10 year history. So we can not only say how your field is doing right now in the past 10 days, but how it looks compared to the past 10 years for this current time period. So we can tell you, well, it looks like you're not doing as well as you did previously. So expect your crop to be a bit worse um, depending on the different situations. And so the, the three important things that we pull in are just your farm location, the crop you planted, and the planting date. And just by knowing those three things, we're able to then determine um, what your current growth state is and then what the projected growth state is. Um, and so in certain situations, I don't think I had this in my slides, but you're able to see um, that when your precipitation decrease or when your, your net primary productivity, the growth of your crop decreases, but your precipitation hasn't changed, you know that you can make an assumption that that's coming in from a different stressor. So it could be biotic, abiotic, and we can alert the farmer to say something's going on in your field that looks like it might decrease your harvest. So let's try and take some action now and see what the actual problem is. Um, did that answer your question? <laughs> okay. Yes, thank you. That's that's extremely interesting. Um, so, what do, what are the the features that you're? Uh, what's on your roadmap? Yep. So on our roadmap is of course making the app more user friendly um, in the sense of as Harry had mentioned the languages. So. We have the app, different apps available in over 29 languages, but it's not fully translated yet. And so um, once we get to the full translations, that would be very ideal for different situations and also help with the text to talks. Um, so the app is able to talk you through each of the steps for diagnosing and the diseases. So improving that as well. Um, We'd also like to see, of course, um, the potential for free reading the plant village data to just get to, um, to reduce the lead farmer costs in general. So the data actually accounts for about 68% of our lead farmer costs that go directly to the farmer. And so being able to reduce that would be um, a scalable option as well for the future. Uh, we'd also like to see more and work more towards feature phone friendly and other services that do not require the access to this the smartphone. We recognize that it is a, a challenge and obstacle that we face in our future and progress requires a smartphone in some situations. And so we need to work towards making sure that that's available to everyone if we want to help um, millions of farmers. How, how many users have you got um, approximately now on feature phones versus on smartphones? So we work with iShamba and Digifarm through their SMS service. So we have our own separate one, which is free for farmers to message. And at that we have around 10,000 farmers on that, I believe, at this point. And then through iShamba and Digifarm, I believe they have over 450,000 um, that they message and have connected to their system. So we, through their system, we send out um, weather advice along with agricultural predictions. So it's not going to rain this week. Don't crop, don't plant your crops yet. Um, that's just an example. But then through our services, we're actually providing a hotline and agricultural information um, service. So that, those are on feature phones? Yeah. And on smartphones? So in smartphones, we have approximately 103 lead farmers in across Kenya right now. And we're in the process of handing out 300 more phones to lead farmers for the rest of this year through a project that we had um, that's funded by CJAR through the International Potato Institute. And are those all in Kenya? Those, the phones are currently in Kenya. However, we're most likely not going to hand them all out in Kenya. So there's potential for us to bring maybe a hundred or so to Tanzania as well. 
Ooh, that's very interesting. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, so I can't see any other questions from people. Um, Revi, do you want to say, you asked about Viamo 321. Um, do you want to say something about that? No, I'm just curious what other people are using for SMS agriculture tools. Um, so, I mean, there's so much, there are so many SMS lines out there and IVR lines, and I think it just helps from a funder perspective to understand what people are using, what people aren't using, um, especially I mean, because we have people from, you know, from Magumu who understand the area. Um, it'd be great to know um, really just across the board uh, what apps are helpful in people's lives. Um, and if there is, you know, if, if those are apps that I have not come across, you know, my radar, I can highlight them to USAID. If there's apps that we think you're using and you're not, that's really good information. So I can go back and say, maybe we shouldn't invest so much in this, but we should look at this instead. So anytime I can get on the ground information um, about what people are using, it's just a great opportunity for me. So if people could share that, like Harry, um, you know, what, what, what apps and services are mostly used in Magumu for a variety of development, um, initiatives. Harry, before you answer that, can I just add that um, with the Digital Champion rollout in 2019, we did do some work at that point with We Farm. Okay. Um, so uh, so they, they did promote their service um, to some extent during that time. So Harry, I don't know if you know if anyone particularly carried on using We Farm since then or what people or if you in fact used it. <laughs> uh, uh, actually, I, I don't really know much about that. Uh, so I guess most of people here in Gum get information through radio, but uh, yeah. there are places in Gum when you, when you reach, you cannot get an access of radio. So it's kind of tricky. Most of people get an access of radio or all of those uh, people who are very close in a little bit in town. So uh, very far from the uh, center in um, Google Center, it's very challenging to get information from the radio. So. And Harry, um, how much do people work with agricultural extension offices? Can you say something about that? Um, the, the, ideally, I mean, ideally, it's those people to work on different villages, but most of those people spend their time in, in town. So, uh, and uh, also, uh, uh, most of farmers in the village, they are really not that very close to those uh, extension uh, offices. So it's really tricky. When I told you yesterday, when I was visiting the, vi the village uh, in Yamburi, and I called the extension officer to, uh, to at least be there, he told me, no, it, uh, I won't be there that, that this day. So sometimes it's very tricky also for them to be around there in the village and helping the farmers. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, so we've got a, a few other people from Tanzania here, Simon, Ajiri. Um, do you, have you used any digital tools for agriculture? Uh, personally, we know um, uh, there is a. Uh, we work quite closely with the Echo. Um, Echo. Uh, uh, the agricultural um, training uh, institution in Arusha, in Tanzania, and they just developed an app uh, which is uh, sounds a bit similar. Uh, not uh, certainly doesn't do any of the, the tracking side of things, uh, but it's it's more like information in your pocket. So the idea is, you, I think you download it offline use so that when you go to the field, you have um, guidelines about how to use conservation agricultural techniques, things like that. Um, that's all I'm familiar with here. I think there was another one where they're measuring soil, uh, soil types. Uh, so you can upload information about soil types. But in terms of sharing information, the only other one was the, the radio, radio, was it Radio Farm Africa, um, uh, where it has the SMS service where you you upload your question through SMS and then it's compiled and then uh, broadcast through a response to your SMS and then also through a radio 
show. Um, I don't know if any of my colleagues, Ibrahim, Ajari, Susan, you have any other thoughts about using S, um, using apps, what you've heard of down, down in Iringa? Well, if not, it would be interesting um, to hear your opinion of um, Plant Nuru and how it compares with the other, with the um, Echo One. Um, certainly in uh, Magumu and, uh, and other places, we've been very impressed with it so far. So if there's no other questions or comments, um, Revi and Annalise, would you like to make any concluding um, remarks before we close? I'll just say that um, it's always really an honor to talk to people that are on the ground that help set my expectation um, about what kind of access to information there is, what kind of devices there is. It really helps me level set donors and funders. And so we can push for things like more community radio, or we can push for things like more ag tech that makes sense as opposed to ag tech that just reproduces, um, you know, social divides or doesn't have the right information or isn't, you know, translated correctly, et cetera. So um, I think this is, this is fabulous. Um, I put my email uh, in there, so I'm always available to, I'll take a free smartphone. Me too. I want a free smartphone. <laughs> um, uh, and um, yeah, someday I'll get to Magumo as well, because I'd love to see all the activities that are going on there. Yes, you're, you're always welcome. Thank <laughs> I you. hope you can. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much for your time again. Um, Annalise? Yeah. Well, thank you everyone for listening, of course, and for Revy, um, for listening to your talk. And it was really lovely to meet you and listen to all of your insights and, and information and Janet for setting it up as well. And um, so I just really wanted to, to leave this talk with the understanding that um, it is really critical moving forward that smallholder farmers have access to this information, even if it's weather predictions or um, what to do in the situation of a new transboundary pest or disease, because just one thing can really devastate the entire season. And we'll just keep seeing people um, going into worse levels of food insecurity. And so we believe the, the solution is through, through farmers and through community led decisions. Um, and so any way to further progress that is the direction that we'll be heading. And it's really important to highlight and acknowledge our, our ground team, which is the dream team. I wish some of them could have been here, um, but they're really the, the force that drives Plant Village. And they're working with the farmers every single day to make sure the app is um, co-created and the information is working and, and combining the local traditional knowledge with, with scientific knowledge as well to make new solutions that apply for many more farmers. And so thank you all for listening. Thank you. All right, thank you everyone. I will share the um, slides and, and the um, recordings afterwards.